Hello, everyone. Welcome back to chapter eight of GOB, the General Organic and Biochemistry course, or Chem 51. In today's chapter, <clears throat> we are looking at solids, liquids, and gases. Specifically, <clears throat> we're looking at intermolecular interactions, so the interactions between molecules um, <clears throat> in general for solids, liquids, and gases. Then we'll look at solids and liquids separate, and then finally we'll look at gases separate as well. With gases, we'll look at uh, gases and pressure, and then finally, the gas laws. Okay, <clears throat> so intermolecular interactions. These are interactions that obey Coulomb's law, which if you're familiar with Coulomb's law, um, you know that the force between two uh, objects to charges in the case of Coulomb's law is proportional to the size of the charge and inversely proportional to the separation squared. Um, so these charges uh, are stronger over shorter distances. Um, so you would imagine they would get stronger as you go from a gas to a liquid to a solid because the distance between molecules decreases when you go from a gas to a liquid to a solid. So just some vocab reminders. So a phase or a state we assume is either a solid, liquid, or a gas. They are the three phases or states that we're interested in in Chem 51. And we assume that if you have a phase, it's consistent throughout that bulk. It's a bulk property. You can have a phase boundary where, for example, a solid and a liquid meet. Or if you put an ice cube in a glass of water, for example, the ice we assume would be in a phase, the solid phase. The liquid water would be in the liquid phase, but where the liquid and the solid met, that would be the boundary, phase boundary. Um, <clears throat> so this last major bullet point here, which phase a substance adopts depends on the pressure and temperature it experiences. Yes, yeah, so the phases can be manipulated by temperature and pressure. For example, if you were to take water with a usual boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius and put it in a vacuum and lower the pressure, it would start to boil uh, <clears throat> because when water boils, it competes against atmospheric pressure. But if you take the atmospheric pressure away in a vacuum, there's no competition. So you essentially boil the water. Uh, this is why liquids boil at lower temperatures at high altitudes. <clears throat> Um, and so temperature obviously can affect phases. If you increase the temperature, the solid phase of water becomes the liquid phase of water as the water melts. And then finally, the vapor phase of water as the water boils. Okay, temperature ranges for the three phases of various materials. Um, let's look at water because that's what we're most familiar with. So it's the second one here. So it's a solid phase if it's pure water, and here we're assuming uh, one atmospheric pressure. Uh, for pure water at one atmospheric pressure, we are a solid at and below zero degrees Celsius. We are a liquid above zero degrees Celsius, and we are a gas above 100 degrees. So as you go from the solid to the liquid to the gaseous phase, you would need a higher and higher temperature to reach that. And you see the same thing for hydrogen. Uh, you need, it's still very low, but it's higher uh, than it is for the liquid or the solid phase to reach the gaseous phase of hydrogen. And sodium chloride, uh, similarly, you go from 801 degrees uh, at the molten liquid phase. If you want to gasify that, you'd have to increase uh, to a much higher, uh, higher temperature. The reason why you have this higher temperature, remember, uh, as you go from the solid to the liquid to the gaseous phase, the energy of the molecules is increasing, right? So kinetic energy is proportional to motion of molecules. The molecules in a gas are moving at a greater velocity than the molecules in a liquid. And that greater velocity corresponds with a greater energy. And that greater energy in the gases is able to overcome the fixed intermolecular forces or intermolecular interactions between the molecules. <clears throat> so the intermolecular forces between molecules 
is fixed. It just depends on what you're made of. The relative velocity of your molecules at a given temperature depends on whether what you're made of makes you present as a solid, liquid, or a gas. Okay. So here it says, why do some substances become liquids at very low temperatures? They essentially have zero or very low, well, they don't have zero. They have very low, very little intermolecular forces. And therefore, little energy is needed to overcome them. Temperature corresponds with energy, low temperature needed to overcome them. Um, okay. Just as one final thought here, the intermolecular forces in solid water are exactly the same as the intermolecular forces in liquid water, but you can't walk through an iceberg. You can walk through water. The only difference is the intermolecular forces are being semi-broken in the liquid, whereas they're not being broken at all in the solid because it lacks the molecular motion because the temperature is not high enough. Ice is cold. In liquid water that you can walk or swim through, the higher relative temperature causes the molecules to move. The molecular motion breaks its own intermolecular forces, and therefore you don't break your bones trying to do that job. The molecules already break their intermolecular forces. Okay. Let's look at the types of intermolecular interactions between components in different solids. So over on the left, we have a structure of diamond, and we can see this nice tetrahedral structure here. Uh, each of these black dots represents a carbon atom, and you can see each carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms in a crystal structure. This regularity of the structure and the fact that any, you know, to to remove any one carbon, you have to disturb a network of other carbons, gives the great strength that we know diamond has. And we represent this type of structure as a covalent network type of structure. Covalent just means it's non-bonding elements that share electrons. And the network just means there's like a buildup or um, an accumulation of these things. It's not just a discrete unit. We can have crystal structures made of ions. So rather than covalent compounds or nonmetals, we can have a mixture of nonmetals and metals. So we form an ionic crystal lattice. So here, this is regular table salt. <coughs> Definitely not as hard as diamond. Hard enough that you could build structures out of it, but definitely not, you know, you can't sharpen uh, a blade with salt. You can with a diamond. Um, and definitely different properties. For example, I believe we saw in the last video prone to, or we saw in the homework prone to fracturing, uh, because the components here are labeled either as a positive or a negative charge. If you disturb the, the sequence of them, you can get two light charges together, which would repel and cause a fissure right through the structure. Whereas in a network covalent solid, uh, a covalent network solid, you don't have labels. Yes, you have carbons, but if you were to swap any one carbon out for another carbon, you'd never know. So you don't get this inherent fracturing of the structure. Um, <clears throat> so here we are looking at uh, different types of uh, covalent bond. Um, so for example, the second bullet point here, a polar covalent bond is where uh, a covalent bond is formed by sharing electrons, but the sharing is unequal. Comparatively, a non-polar covalent bond is where the sharing is relatively equal. So if we look at this cartoon down here, this demonstrates two atoms. We're not sure what they are, but they're two gray spheres. They have a bond between them. The bond is either a line or you could look at the red dots, which would be a pair of electrons. Um, so either look at the line or the dots, we wouldn't look at both. Um, so let's just look at the dots for now. Let's ignore the line. 
we can see that the dots are closer to this atom on the right. Pay no attention to the fact that the atom is larger. Sometimes it's larger, sometimes it's smaller. It doesn't matter. But either way, this lone, this pair, not lone, this pair of electrons, this bonding pair of electrons is closer to this larger atom. That means it's shared unequally because if it were equal, it would be in the middle, right? So to represent that um, <clears throat> unequal sharing, we annotate this with uh, this arrow here. The arrow essentially is drawn parallel to the bond. The head of the arrow is to the end of the molecule, which has the greatest share of electrons. So here, because the electrons are being shared unequally, we put the head of the arrow thusly, and we represent this accumulation of charge density as a delta negative. It just means a partial accumulation of negative charge. So it's not a true ion. It's just, it's got a whiff of negativity about it. Um, <clears throat> on the tail end of the arrow, we put a plus sign, and we annotate that with a delta positive. This is a deficit of electron density. Again, not a true charge, not a cation, but definitely in a, a deficit of electron density. The fact that these are different, one is delta positive, one is delta negative, that difference make, makes this a pole. A pole just means the ends are different. And so this bond is a polar bond. Let's look at types of intermolecular interactions or intermolecular forces. So red from top to bottom, they are in strength, decreasing strength. And you definitely want to, when you consider intermolecular forces, you want to consider the strongest first and the weakest last. Um, so iron dipole, this is between an iron, a true iron, like a cation or an anion, and a polar molecule. So we've just seen a pole uh, previously. So that's what would be represented here. Here in this diagram, you can just see the arrow uh, inside this egg-shaped structure. They've color-coded it red and blue. So red is the region of high electron density. You can see it's the bottom of the egg shape. So it bulges by the region of high electron density. That's the bulging of electron density. And it the point is a region of electron deficiency. <clears throat> So the region of high electron density, the delta negative, is attracted through space to the positive cation. This dashed line here is the iron dipole. And we have values, approximate values, in kilojoules per mole. A hydrogen bond <clears throat> is a similar through space interaction between a, an activated hydrogen on one molecule and a very specific element on an adjacent molecule. The activated hydrogen must be on an element A, where A is either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So not any hydrogen can hydrogen bond. Specifically, the hydrogen has to be bonded directly to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And then what does it hydrogen bond with? An adjacent molecule, an element B in the adjacent molecule itself must be either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So it's a very exclusive club is the hydrogen bond club. Here we can see hydrogen bonding between two water molecules. On the left, this hydrogen is activated because it is directly bonded to an oxygen. And then it directly hydrogen bonds with an oxygen. So that fulfills this criterion and we have a hydrogen bond. Dipole-dipole interactions are between two poles. So here we have one polar molecule and we get the bulbous electron rich end of one polar molecule interacting through space with the pointy electron deficient end of an adjacent polar molecule. Uh, and that has a certain value in kilojoule per mole. Uh, that's a permanent dipole-dipole interaction. We can have an ion-induced dipole interaction. So instead of an ion-dipole, where we assume the dipole is permanent because of the constituent elements of the, of the pole, we can have an induced dipole. So very cleverly, we have this circle here, which would be 
the induction of the dipole takes us from the circle to the egg shape. This is induced uh, by proximity. So you can essentially not mechanically squeeze the circle, but you can cause the internal restructuring of electron density because of um, electrostatic squeezing. Um, I'll briefly mention that in a second. But for now, let's assume that we have induced, we've squoze in this electron density, we've squeezed it into one end to form a temporary dipole because we can let go and then it's gone again. So we've induced a temporary dipole that can interact with an ion just as a regular dipole can. It's, it's weak because the uh, uh, temporary nature of the dipole. If we have two temporary dipoles interacting in a fashion analogous to dipole-dipole interaction, but on a temporary basis, that would be a dispersion force or a London dispersion force. It's the weakest of all the intermolecular forces. And this is the easiest, this is the gateway club, right? So the only prerequisite to have in London dispersion forces are electrons. LDF, so London dispersion forces, are proportional to the number of electrons. Single elements can have London dispersion forces. Molecules can have them. Uh, every molecule or element has them. They're proportional to the number of your electrons. Okay, let's look at some ways of representing interactions with molecules. So on the left, again, we have a water molecule. Here is the ball and stick representation. We have the oxygen and the two hydrogens. Here it is here as well. Uh, the OH bond is polar. And because we have um, polarity, again, the two hydrogens are the electron deficient end. The oxygen is the electron superfluous end. So we have two dipoles pointing at the oxygen. That would give us a net dipole across the entire molecule. So now if we look at the entire molecule, from the electron deficient hydrogen end to the electron plenty oxygen end, we can see this slow color gradation in this particular diagram from blue to red, but that would represent an increase in electron density. So we could draw a line literally uh, from the bottom to the top, pointing directly upwards, and that would represent a net dipole. Conversely, methane has no polar bonds, so it has no net dipole. What's the consequence of this? Well, if you have polarity, if you have a net dipole, you can stick to a neighbor. So we can see here two adjacent water molecules, the electron uh, excessive oxygen end is going to be attracted by a hydrogen bonding to the electron deficient hydrogen end of an adjacent molecule. This is what makes water sticky. It sticks to you, it sticks to itself. It accumulates in oceans. Water is typically presented as a liquid or solid under reasonable temperatures on this planet. Methane presents as a gas under reasonable temperatures on this planet because it's not sticky. There's no intermolecular forces other than London dispersion forces, but they only manifest uh, with high proximity and gases don't exhibit that unless you force them to with high pressure. So under regular, under reasonable temperature and pressure conditions on this planet, methane presents as a gas. Okay, hydrogen bonding, we've already discussed that a little bit. Uh, I think we've literally discussed this structure here. So again, an element must be either O, N, or F, and it must interact through space with a hydrogen that itself is bonded directly to O, N, or F. We can lead to this uh, network effect here, uh, and this is what would form to give a regular structure in solid ice, for example, uh, give it a nice crystalline structure, uh, etc. Okay, let's summarize different types of solids. So this is a nice uh, visual. First of all, let's separate crystalline and amorphous solids. So 
you can get a powdered solid or you can crystallize it to get a crystalline solid. The difference is the regularity of the constituents. So let's say, for example, you're building a wall. You can have a nice regular construction pattern in your wall, and that would be a the equivalent of a molecular crystal. Whereas you can just quickly throw some pebbles, throw some mortar, and you get like this random structure. That would be more amorphous. There's less regularity in the structure. There's differences. You know, this region over here is different than this region over here. Whereas every region in a crystalline structure is the same as every other region. And we get enhanced strength in a crystalline structure, superior mechanical properties in a crystalline structure. Okay, so let's focus now on the crystalline structure. Within this crystalline structure, we can have an array of different types of solids. We can have molecular solids. Um, we can have uh, molecular crystalline solids, ionic crystalline solids, network solids, and metallic solids. We're not going to worry too much about metallic solids here, but suffice it to say you can crystallize a metal and it would just look like a very high performance, mechanical performance piece of metal. Enough about that for now. It's not going to be that relevant to us in Chem 51. Let's look at molecular crystalline solids. Um, we could have, if you follow this blue line, we can have nonpolar. So a molecule, a nonpolar molecule here, we've got CO2. So the black dot represents carbon. The two red dots represent oxygen. That's a nonpolar molecule and they can form a covalent solid. So for example, this would be dry ice or solid carbon dioxide. It can form a crystalline solid and that would be a nonpolar molecular crystalline solid. We can have a polar ionic crystalline solid. Example here would be sodium chloride. Um, so we've seen that in a previous slide, I think. We just quickly go back to where we saw that. Holy shit, it was a long time ago. Yeah, this would be a, a polar ionic crystalline solid. We have this regular network effect. Okay. And then um, a network crystalline solid. Uh, no, sorry, not that. Uh, and then finally, a diamond. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I've just spoken out of turn. Just in case I spoke out of turn, let's repeat real quick. So over here, molecular crystalline solid, these three objects are all linked to molecular crystalline solid. We have a nonpolar molecule like CO2, it can form a network crystal like dry ice. So that would be an example of that. Um, an example of a polar molecule that forms a network uh, solid, that would be, for example, um, can I move that? Yes, that would be that. That was just in the wrong place. Okay, so it's a polar molecule and it forms a network like a piece of ice water. That would be uh, a crystal form from a polar molecule. And then, uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna put it in the middle. I kind of had it over here because it, technically it's hydrogen bonded. It's also polar, so I'm gonna put it right in the middle. So it would be both. Okay. Ionic crystalline solid, NaCl is the example we've seen before. Network crystalline solid, we saw diamond as a previous example, and we commented that we won't worry too much about metals, but you can crystallize a piece of metal. It would look to the human eye just like a piece of metal, but it would be a high performance metal rather than just a piece of metal that you could buy in the store. Okay, so we should know the difference between these three phases of matter. We have uh, solids, liquids, and gases. So we know that solids have a definite shape. That's why we build things out of them. 
They have a definite volume, definite mass. Particles are close together uh, and they have low kinetic energy. That's what this arrow pointing down means. Because um, they're either cold or the molecules are moving slowly. That's why they keep their shape. So they have the relative motion, regardless of the temperature, is low relative motion. Liquids don't have a definite shape. They can flow. Uh, they do typically have a definite volume, a definite mass. They're similarly closely packed, but less regular. And because of their motion, their flowing, their fluidity, uh, the kinetic energy of the molecules has increased with respect to the solid. A gas, definitely no definite shape, no definite volume. So we have this expansion and compression that we can do with gases. Does have a definite mass. They all have a definite mass because of conservation of mass. Um, particles are far apart, so that makes them different. And they have the highest kinetic energy uh, of all the um, phases. Okay, because of the peculiarity of gases, this not definite shape, not definite volume, the fast motion, the fact that the space between them, they're moving, uh, they're far apart from each other. We're gonna look at gases uh, separately. So the kinetic molecular theory of gases, this essentially describes how gases move. Now we could talk about ideal gases here, but because we're only going to look at ideal gases, we really don't need to say that they're ideal. We're just not going to look at real gases. So we're going to look at gases in this course that are relatively low temperature, relatively low pressure. Uh, so in a nutshell, the kinetic theory of gases says that gases, um, it doesn't really matter what the nature of the gas is we can just call them gas because they're ideal. It doesn't matter what the type of gas is. We're going to assume zero intermolecular forces. The nature of what the gas is, is the elements that compose the gas would determine what intermolecular forces. We're just gonna assume there are none, so it doesn't matter. Okay, that's one thing. We assume that the space between adjacent molecules is very large compared to the volume or the space occupied by the molecule itself. So we can really assume point particles of gas with very large distances between them. Um, we can assume incessant motion so they don't stop above absolute zero temperature. Random motion, so it can't be uh, predicted. And haphazard, uh, it's in any old direction. So random haphazard incessant motion above absolute zero. This motion, when that motion collides with an object, it, it translates into pressure. So pressure is force per unit area. So if you imagine this is the skin of a balloon, my hand is the skin of a balloon. I'm not sure if I'm on the camera here, but my hand is the skin of a, in fact, let me just make sure I can see. Yes, um, there's the skin of the balloon. Let's say my fist is a gas molecule and it's constantly moving randomly, haphazardly, that's what stops the balloon deflating. Um, that pressure, that force exerted per unit area, that's the force of the gas inside of a balloon, maintaining the um, maintaining the inflation of that balloon. Or inflatable, I guess it's summer now, so an inflatable would have a standard ideal gas inside it. There are different units of gases um, it's worthwhile knowing maybe one or two of them, um, but typically, you know, at this level, they're probably just going to be provided. I would know one atmospheric pressure is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. And then I would expect that the rest would be provided. Okay, gases and pressure. So here's a diagram of kinetic molecular theory. So here we've got a container. We've got these spheres that are colliding with the container. Notice they're moving in straight lines until they hit something, then they move off at, at an unpredictable angle. So here the angle's different, here the angle's different, here the angle's different. So you could never pitch these things. You don't know where they're gonna go. Um, 
but you know that they're always going to move in straight lines. They're never going to stop. And every time they hit the boundary here, they generate a pressure, essentially because of conservation of linear momentum. So if you're a physics type thinker, think of conservation of linear momentum. Um, okay. Let's look at this profile here. So we have a profile um, on the y-axis, we have relative number of nitrogen molecules. So this is just a fraction. I'm going to call this fraction. And then on the x-axis, we have velocity in units of meter per second. So for one type of gas uh, at different temperatures, notice we have a profile at 300 Kelvin, a lower or a different profile at 600 Kelvin, different profile, profile at 9 and 1200 Kelvin. So notice that as the temperature increases, the profile, the population becomes broader and it sh its population maximum shifts to the right to higher uh, velocity. That's because of the relationship between this fraction of molecules in the gas and mass and temperature. So the fraction is proportional to mass. It's inversely proportional to temperature. Now the mass is fixed, right? So it's all nitrogen. So let's say the mass is always fixed, but the temperature is increasing. The fraction at a, the fraction is inversely proportional to temperature. That's why the fraction decreases at higher temperature because of that inverse proportionality. On the diagram on the right, we have fraction again, but now we've got velocity again, but we have the same temperature and rather than vary the temperature, we're fixing the temperature and we're varying the mass. Here, the mass is represented by different gases. Xenon has a larger mass. Krypton is lower, argon is lower, neon is lower, helium is lowest of all. Fraction is directly proportional to mass. Xenon has the highest fraction. Helium has the lowest mass, therefore the lowest fraction. So these profiles are important. Uh, collectively, they're known as Maxwell's uh, velocity distribution of gases. Usually in, in this course, we don't look specifically at Maxwell's velocity distribution. It's more of a general chemistry consideration. But I think even in GOB, we can remember mass, the fraction of molecules behave in a certain, having a certain behavior is proportional to the temperature and in, uh, sorry, is inversely proportional to that temperature. And the fraction exerting a certain behavior is proportional to the mass. I think uh, we can remember that. Gas laws. So we start to look at some gas laws. We have Boyle's law after Henry Boyle, which shows that pressure is inversely proportional to velocity. Sorry, no, it doesn't. Pressure is inversely proportional to volume. Here, it's an uppercase V, so it's volume. We can either say pressure is inversely proportional to volume, or we can just say it's directly proportional to the inverse of volume. Um, when we perform calculations, we're essentially looking at initial and final conditions. So the product of pressure and volume doesn't change. It's initial product is equal to its final product. Um, so that's how we perform a calculation. And for my students, at least I post uh, calculations separately. This is just the presentation of the content. The practice of the content comes in problem sets and homework, etc. cetera. Charles law, as in the French Charles, volume is proportional to temperature. Uh, so we have inverse, pressure and volume, direct volume and temperature. If we combine that knowledge together, we can see we had uh, P and V, they had an inverse proportionality. So if one goes up, the other comes down. Uh, volume and temperature, Charles law had a direct proportionality. If you scale one, you scale the other. Um, and so we combine that together. We have pressure and volume as a numerator. Temperature must be as a de denominator. 
incidentally, in general, you know, if two variables are inversely proportional, we write them as a product. If two variables are directly proportional, we write them as a fraction. So PV are products, V and T are fractions, put all three information together. We get PV as a product, V and T as a fraction. So we get PV over T under initial conditions equals PV over T under final conditions. This is called the combined gas law. We've essentially here, uh, well, to get this uh, Bonesley the way we did here, we combine Charles' law and Boyle's law. Actually, there's a third law that's not really mentioned in our GOB course. Uh, the product, uh, sorry, the fraction of pressure and temperature or the proportionality of pressure and temperature, that independently is called Gay-Lussac's law. Uh, but we never mentioned that, so we just combine two gas laws here. But nevertheless, it's called the combined gas law. The ideal gas law is the product of pressure and volume, which is equal to moles times by a constant R, which is numerically equal to this value here, and then temperature in units of Kelvin. This is known as the ideal gas law, and R is the ideal gas constant. And final slide for this video is Dalton's law of partial pressure. So that basically says, because we're assuming no intermolecular forces, if we look at pressure from gas one independently, we look at pressure from gas two independently, we can essentially assume that when they're added, it's just the sum of each contributing gas. They don't do anything to each other. P2 doesn't influence P1. P1 doesn't influence P2, they just add. So we can uh, say that if we add, for example, uh, this pressure to this pressure, we just get a total pressure, which is the sum. Okay, and that will conclude this video.